Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is the first video in a series documenting the process that I go through when designing and fabricating a mechanical prosthetic hand. With the growth of my channel and the YouTube fame that comes with it, I get between three and four messages on my social media every day regarding X tragic thing that has happened to someone's loved one. And if only I would just build them a hand like mine, their life would be able to return to what it was before their unfortunate circumstance. While I would love to help everyone that asks me for a prosthetic device, the logistics, costs, and time required to fabricate such a thing just doesn't allow for it. The hand that I use as my daily driver took a little over 600 hours to complete start to finish. Now here's the thing, a prosthetic hand that I designed for myself is really only going to fit me because I designed it based upon the size and proportion of my natural hand. Now I have pretty big hands. My palm is right at 4 inches wide and an inch and a quarter at the metacarpal and almost 2 inches at the base of my thumb. My socket is really only going to fit my hand. Every amputation is as personal as fingerprints. Everything from the available range of motion and physical strength capable from the residual limb to the shape and areas of sensitive tissue that make up the skin on the damaged hand are all important factors that need to be considered when planning out and designing a mechanically driven prosthetic device. Because the motion of the device is driven by the physical motion of the hand in relation to the forearm, the total grip strength is translated to the damaged hand in three places. On the palm side of the hand at the point of the amputation, on the back of the hand where the metacarpals all come together, and where the lever arm portion of the prosthesis contacts the forearm. Think of it as a teeter-totter, only with a hinge in the middle. Say that through the gears and levers, you're able to generate around 20 pounds of grip force with the fingers. That means that the area that is contacted by the socket at the base of the hand, around 40 pounds of force is going to be applied to that tissue. 20 pounds to counter the force translated by the fingers and 20 pounds to counter the force from the forearm. It's particularly important that too much pressure isn't being applied to any one area of the hand. Depending upon age, not everyone is going to be able to tolerate the same amount of pressure without causing bruising or other skin conditions. Ideally, you would want to have the contact area of the socket as large as practical in order to lessen the pounds per square inch being applied to the tissue of the hand. This is where the custom aspect of the prosthetic is most evident. The socket is the most important piece of the prosthetic appliance, and if it doesn't fit the user incredibly well, then all of the subsequent work that goes into the rest of the hand is just going to go to waste. Both the fit and operating speed of the device is the most common reasons that upper limb prosthetic devices are rejected by the end user and end up living on a shelf rather than getting used on a daily basis. Because of these limiting factors, it has led me to the conclusion that the best and most effective way that I'll be able to help all those that want the help is to aid them from exactly where they are by documenting the process that I go through when designing and fabricating a prosthetic device for myself. With that, I think it would be a great idea if the end user was responsible for the fit of the socket. That way, the race against the clock to get it done and fit as fast as possible is done away with and the socket can take as long as it needs to in order to get a fit that is just right. Once you have a socket built, then try it out, wear it for a day or two, all day, and see how it really fits you as your hand naturally swells and shrinks throughout the day. If it's too tight in any spot, dremel that area out. If it feels too loose, add back some goo and build it up until you have a socket that you can wear all day long with loading and it not bite you anywhere. That's why I produced the How to Build a Socket series of videos last year, because if you decide to hire me to design and fabricate a device for you, ultimately, you're going to need to build your own socket and send it to me for further fabrication, unless, of course, you live near me or are willing to make a bunch of trips to my shop. For my current build, I'm using the socket that I built during the video that I showed how to use the Alumalite two-part silicon molding compound. After sanding the fiberglass down to an even shape, I added back resin and canvas cloth to build up the areas that I intended to use as mounting points for the fingers, levers, and assemblies. 
I did this by taking cardboard and superglue and creating forms that held the resin and canvas mixture in order to get the final shape that I needed. Sometimes it takes a couple of pours in order to build it up enough to get the organic shapes that I'm aiming for. For this build, I'm affixing all of the components with 440 cap screws and T-nuts. I encapsulated the T-nuts within the socket by placing all of the fixtures, then roughing the inside of the socket with a small sanding bit on a Dremel, and then laminating a thin sock to the inside of the socket. To do this, I put a nitrile glove on my hand, being sure to tape it to my wrist so that I wouldn't get any resin on my hand or arm. From there, I put on the silicon liner and stretched a thin sock over the liner, cutting a hole for my thumb to go through. Then I mixed up a small batch of resin, two, maybe three ounces at the most. Be sure to use less catalyst than you normally would when doing this, so the resin doesn't go off too fast and get too warm. Remember, there's an exothermic reaction going on as the resin cures, so proceed at your own risk. After the resin is mixed thoroughly, completely coat the sock and the inside of the socket. Once you're sure that you have everything coated well, and there's a little bit pooling in the bottom of the socket, Maybe add just a little bit extra to the inside of the socket, just to be sure that everything will bond and you won't end up getting any dry areas. Then slip your sock covered hand into the socket and hold it there, being sure to maintain constant pressure onto the socket until the resin is kicked. What I usually do in order to know when that has happened is pour a small amount of excess resin onto a piece of cardboard and watch for it to gel and then harden, so that you know when the resin has completely gone off. Now I'm absolutely sure that there are better ways to do this, but this is the easiest way that I have found to laminate something to the inside of a form without setting up a bunch of additional pieces. Also, remember, I'm not your mom and you're not mine, so proceed at your own risk. Remember, this whole project is aimed at the DIY aspect of building your own prosthetic device. If you are not comfortable with everything that goes on in fabricating your own socket, then feel free to hire a prosthetics company to fabricate one for you. As a rough estimate, to build this socket, I probably used around $100 of materials and most of a day worth of time. And with that, I managed to build a socket that fits me very well. Now that I have a good socket, it's time to start working on the new design of the fingers. After using this hand for the past year, it has given me a lot of insight as to the little things that I'd like to change in this next build. One of which is how the fingers themselves articulate. The current hand offers all kinds of compliance, but at the cost of constrained motion. What that means is that the only thing that regulates the portion of the fingers that move first is the resistance of the springs that's used to extend the fingers. Usually that doesn't cause any issues, but sometimes when I'm trying to grab something, I notice that the distal is closed all the way, while the medial and proximals are nearly straight. What I'm looking to do with this new design is to have the motion of one portion of the finger be dependent upon the motion of another. In this case, the motion of the distal is powered by the relative position of the proximal in relation to the medial and metacarpal phalangeal joint. The base of the proximal is rotated around its axle by the linear motion of the number 15 chain whereas the motion of the previous design was achieved by drawing the chain through all of the segments of the finger, with the chain attached to at the base of the distal and also at the clevis where it connected to the rest of the linkage. This idea of powering the proximals is kind of a step backwards design-wise for me, as it was how the fingers were actuated in a couple of previous designs. But whatever, it worked pretty well in those versions, so might as well run with that idea again. Another main goal of this hand is to finally implement individual control of the fingers. I designed the new metacarpal base to have an area to mount the miniature stepper motors that I'm using to lock and unlock the fingers. For that, I'm using a Palau 6500 low voltage motor driver to control the stepper motors. The motion of the fingers is still mechanically driven, but the individual addressability of the fingers is going to be controlled by a gesture based GUI on a Metro Mini with an OLED display and a 521 gyro. This is something that I've been trying to get going for the past couple of generations, but have never been able to get it just right to where I feel that it would be reliable enough to use on my daily driver. I might just have it with this one, but time will tell. Back to the design process that I went through in order to get to where I am now. The design previous to this one 
combined all the compliance that I had with my current hand with the driven proximals of the earlier models. The reason I didn't go with this one, even after prototyping and building one out of aluminum, was purely out of complexity and part count. It may have looked great and functioned pretty well, but it had just way too many parts. So after about three weeks of building, testing, and refining, I decided to scrap the entire idea and come up with this new, new option. With this one, the finger segments are hard linked one to the next, and by using the chain to drive the proximals, it still manages to retain an aspect of being compliant. It should work pretty good in the real world, but again, we'll see. So now that I had the fingers designed and prototyped, I had to figure out a way to mount the fingers to the socket. I decided that I wanted to retain the splay function that I had on the current hand, as it turned out to be way more useful than I ever thought it would when I designed it last year. And the manner in which I executed the motion had been surprisingly resilient. So in order to mount the fingers so that they'd be able to rotate in place on the socket, I fabricated a couple stainless steel strips and machined pins that the bearings and metacarpal bases would be able to rotate around. Those plates are held in place by 12 T-nuts and 440 cap screws, six on the top, six on the bottom. This makes it pretty easy to install and remove the fingers from the socket. The splay linkage is still located on the palm and is going to be driven by the lateral motion of the wrist, just like before. New to this hand, I'm mounting two strips of LEDs to the palm of the socket so they'll have a flashlight built into the hand. Should be a pretty useful addition, or it might just end up being a Zuzu, but I won't know until I get it going and really start using it. That's where I'm going to end this video. In subsequent videos, I'll cover the actual fabrication of the fingers and their assembly. I'd also like to thank all of the people that have chosen to support me on Patreon. Your support really goes a long way. I really do have the best subscribers in the whole of YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks for watching.